Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first edition of Spartan Nation Now. I'm Andrew Pang, your host. It has been a great pleasure to be able to write about the San Jose State Spartans on 24-7 Sports for Inside the Spartans. On this week's show, I'll recap a big San Jose State football homecoming win, catch up with Athletics Director Jeff Konya about the year in Spartan Athletics, and host a roundtable discussion about the week in Mountain West football with special guest rep- Special guest, 24-7 sports reporter, Lorenzo J. Reyna. Then I'll read some of, of your letters. So it's the first episode here, so let me first acknowledge those who have read my work and have, and over the years, and hold freshman orientation. If you're a new listener to this show, you've, or you're introduced to Inside the Spartans for the first time. So if you've been following my stories over the years, first of all, let me say, Thank you so much as I am launching this new, this new weekly show in order to give fans another way to get the latest news about San Jose State football, basketball, and other sports, especially in the age where the way people consume information on the internet has been changing with, you know, think Spotify, YouTube, you name the various online platforms or whatever you use to listen to music or podcasts like, uh, your iPod or iPhone or your smartphone. If you want to, like, if you want to get uh, get the latest news about San Jose State while doing the dishes or other things important in your real life, but you don't want to be multitasking, reading stuff while doing said work. Um, I hope that this podcast will serve as a very convenient way to cons- to get the li- to be informed about your favorite sports team and. Right now, this is only a first episode. I'm learning on the job as a certain San Jose State football coach is doing. And this on YouTube, as you'll see, this is going to be an audio only uh, audio only video for now. As time goes by, I do hope to expand this to other platforms and add, you know, video, moving pictures as other 24-7 sports uh, theme podcasts do and I'm always open to ideas about how to make this project better and I always welcome your feedback so do please post uh, on the comments below or at insidethespartans.com where we've got a message board where you, you can respond to the show so with that let's get to the biggest story of the week San Jose State football got a win last Saturday for homecoming 42 to 21 over Utah State the Spartans have won two in a row and are three and five, including two and two at Mountain West play. This win, to put it briefly, was a big deal for many reasons. One, San Jose State really needed that win. Having piled up five losses, including three with second half lead given away, the team is in danger of not getting a second straight bowl game. Two, this was the first time since 2014 that San Jose State has won two straight homecoming games. That's right. Nine years. You know, there has been there have been generations. That means that there have been two generations of freshmen who graduated without being able to see two homecoming wins in a row. And add that to the latest example of how today's students don't know how good they have it. And I think to be on and I was there at the press box getting to getting to see all the action as I've been doing since 2015 the student sections have been doing a lot better lately, and I think that this year's uh, at the homecoming game this year, the student section was rowdy and keeping it lit. Keeping it lit. I'm glad they did get to stay until late in the third quarter, early in the fourth, from what I recall. Excuse me. The students didn't really leave until it became more clear that San Jose State was in control, judging by the final score. And lastly. Guess when the last time was that San Jose State won over Utah State? That date was October 11, 2008, when Dick Tomey, Brent Brennan's mentor, was still the head coach. And for me, selfishly, I was still a senior in high school. As for the game itself, Chevin Cordero had a very efficient day at quarterback passing uh, passing 15 for 20 with 119 yards and three touchdowns. Kyrie Robinson rushed for 102 yards and, a t- and one touchdown, and Quali Conley had 79 yards and two touchdowns on the ground. Now, let's get to the highlights. 
San Jose State scored on the opening drive after Quali Conley had a 10-yard touchdown run on the opening drive to give San Jose State a 7-0 lead. Then, Taryn Shive went out for the kickoff, but San Jose State still maintained possession. How? I'll let Kevin Richardson explain, so here's this clip from the Spartan Sports Network. That onside. Yes, Shive will get the whistle. He'll put a high spinning kick deep. Davis will get it at the 4, Davis at the 10, Davis at the 15, and then blow oh. the ball is out. San Jose State comes up with it. Just a big collision down at the 15-yard line. Great energy so far getting a turnover right after the touchdown. With a 15-yard field, San Jose State did get inside the 5, but Cordero made a costly mistake. Cordero keeps, ball is out as the defender put the ball right on Shevin Cordero's midsection. The ball came out, and Spears for Utah State comes up with the fumble recovery. Cordero carried that ball two yards on a third and one. This would have been a first and goal with better ball security on the fake handoff. The focus should have been on getting it a first down and keeping the ball rather than getting greedy. That would be my easy Monday morning quarterback comment. So Utah State has a fast-paced, high-scoring offense, and they were threatening as they started from their own four and got 36 yards on five snaps. However, San Jose State finally figured out a way to pressure Utah State's true freshman quarterback, McKay Hillstead, and Jordan Pollard grabbed an errant pass. Play action. Hillstead wants to throw, now needs to run. Fires it across the middle. It's taken away by Pollard. Pollard at the 40 as he knocks... The tight end, Brock Lane down, and we are just into the first quarter, and we've seen three turnovers. San Jose State was able to enter the red zone once again, but then came another turnover. Robinson will get it. Right side run across the 10, down to the 8. Aggies claim they have the ball. There was no whistle, and I believe we've got a turnover. The beanbag came out, Kevin. And the referees will tell us fumble by Kyrie Robinson. By the offense, recovered by the defense. First down, Utah State. So, San Jose State came up empty on two straight red zone possessions. That had echoes of that 2014 home finale versus Hawaii where San Jose State lost 13-0 despite zero punts and multiple red zone opportunities. Thankfully, the defense did their job, forcing a three and out. For the fourth time in the game, San Jose State took the ball inside the red zone and this time got something out of it when Cordero found a wide open Kyrie Robinson and completed a four yard touchdown pass. Robinson, the tailback, here comes Nash in motion. Fake to Nash, Cordero rolls right, throws it to Robinson. Touchdown, San Jose State got the defense looking one way. Cordero came back to the right, just snuck it in there to Kyrie Robinson for six. San Jose State entered the fourth quarter up 14-0. But given that they had four trips to the red zone thanks to two defensive takeaways, it's reasonable to ask. Shouldn't they have been up at least 20, heck, 28-0? Well, the answer would be yes, because San Jose State had no answers to Utah State's up-tempo offense with, that has little time wasted between snaps. Utah State scored twice in the second with a 5-yard Rasul Faison run and a 25-yard pass from Hillstead to Micah Davis. San Jose State did have another red zone opportunity but got zero points out of it, losing 12 yards due to a tackle for loss, a false start, and a sack before Kyler Halverson missed a 48-yard field goal attempt. At least San Jose State forced a late 3 and out to limit Utah State's damage to a 14-14 tie at halftime. So the question will now be, which Spartan team are we going to see? The team that just disappeared into second halves against Toledo, Air Force, and Boise State? Or the team that shut down New Mexico the week before? At first, it appeared that Utah State would take their first lead when Hillstead completed a 37-yard field-flipping pass to Micah Davis on 3rd and 9. However, an offensive holding penalty wiped that play off the books and forced a third and 19 from the Utah State 28. San Jose State this time got the stop. Here's Kevin. 
Hillstead with the snap, looks left, now needs to run, now is bottled up, tries Ooh. to throw it away. We'll see if we get an intentional grounding, but great job there by the Derrick Odom defense. Noah Lavulo right there, along with Sione Toya. And that'll bring up fourth down. We'll see the punting unit for the third time tonight for the Aggies. Ultimately, there was no intentional grounding call. And Trey Smith got credited for a quarterback hurry. Hillstead had thrown the, had thrown the ball away before taking the sack from uh, Noah Lovulo and Suana Toya. Matthew Coleman would fair catch the punt at the San Jose State 27 yard line, and San Jose State got in business taking over six minutes off the clock. Now this drive again had a fortunate turn of events on third down. On third and on a third and seven from a Utah State 46, where a defensive pass interference penalty gifted San Jose State a free 15 yard first down. In this drive, San Jose State had twice faced third downs and converted them both, including this Cordero keeper. Cordero out of the gun. He'll bring Mazzotti in motion. He'll take the snap. Four-man rush. Now he's flush. Now needs to run. Outruns the defender. Pulls it down. 20, 15, 10, and then runs out of bounds and hit out of bounds. There was no flag for a late hit out of bounds, but first and goal from the eight is great field position regardless. Then it took just one play for San Jose State to take the lead right back thanks to a rather creative blocking scheme. I'll let Kevin take it away. Leek Williams will sub in at right tackle. Jaime Navarro will line up at tight end. Off of his flank is the big Skyler loving black. Offset eye. Charlie Rogers the fullback. Quali Conley the tailback. Conley will get it. Left side run. Great blocking and he is in. Touchdown San Jose State. Quali Conley blasts it in. I apologize for the brief technical difficulties right there, but the drop in audio was not your device, but rather the source I got these highlights clips from. I was recorded. Um, I got these. Uh, I recorded these straight off of KTRB, the radio station that carries the San Jose State football games, while I was at the game, in fact. <laughs> So San Jose State is up 21-14 with 6.27 left at the third. And then they forced a fourth and one at the Utah State 34. Yes, fourth down defense has been a weakness this season for San Jose State. And Utah State did seek to exploit it. But going for it from your own side of the field into the third while down just one touchdown? That could reveal multiple angles of the coaching mindset right there. One, you're not respecting the opposing defense, assuming they've got this problem they can't solve about stopping fourth downs. Two, there's a lack of confidence in your defense to stop the opponent. You'd already let them have the ball for over six minutes. Do you really want to risk them doing it again? Well, Utah State tried and failed to attack what they thought was a San Jose State weakness. Again, here's Kevin Richardson the tight end lane they'll bring a man in motion that's Vaughn they'll fake it to him now they swing it to Vaughn he gives ground is hit in the backfield twists and turns Trey Smith there the rest of the Spartans there and he is short of the first down the Utah State Aggies give the ball up on downs great hustle by the Spartans Kevin so on Sunday night I was watching the fourth quarter of the Miami Dolphins at Philadelphia Eagles game up 24 to 17 the Eagles had just gotten a touchdown-saving interception. And there was this drive where they twice faced fourth and one inside their own 40 and converted both times on jumbo sneak plays before getting a touchdown to go up 31-17. to The Eagles clearly had re rehearsed that play during the week. Utah State, on the other hand, went for a lower percentage delayed handoff that San Jose State blew up immediately for a loss. Maybe next time teams are going to think twice about keeping the offense on fourth downs against San Jose State especially inside the 40. And what do you know, San Jose State did make Utah State pay for gifting them that short 33-yard field on that stupid fourth down gamble. Here's a name you're not many fans are going to be familiar with, but there's this fullback named Charlie Rogers getting his first career touchdown. Cordero under center. Now they'll move Rogers to the right. Cordero wants to roll to the right side, picks up a block, fires it to Rogers, the linebacker, turned fullback into the end zone, touchdown, San Jose State. Tip of the cap to Kevin McGiven, a great play call. Cue the LED lights. 
Now, Charlie Rogers has an interesting background, having come to San Jose State from our conference rival San Diego State back in 2021. So he was this backup uh, linebacker, fullback for a while before finally getting his chance to block for the offense this year. And he spoke at at the post-game press conference detailing his journey and his opportunity to play at San Jose State. Uh, I wasn't a big recruit coming out. Um, I took a shot at San Diego State to actually play uh, fullback down there. Um, That's where I started out. They got rid of the fullback position. Um, I played linebacker my whole life, and I really wanted to do that. Um, So I entered the transfer portal looking for a shot. I was very lucky to be given the opportunity to play and be a part of this team um, playing linebacker. Um, And that just got my foot in the door here. And I've just been trying to do anything I can to help the team, whatever it is, special teams, defense, and now uh, this year, eventually offense. Um, Kind of funny full circle moment getting back to fullback. Um, But that was pretty much uh, just being really lucky to be able to be a part of this team. Following the first career touchdown for Charlie Rogers, San Jose State entered the fourth quarter up 28-14, to but they had to punt the ball back after a Cordero screen pass for 17 yards that Conley got called back due to an offensive holding penalty. So this could have been a here-we-go-again moment. We've seen this movie before when San Jose State was at Boise State and gave up a 20-point lead in that loss, but now the defense got the job done again, forcing San- Utah State to go two and turnover. First when Tanya, Taniela Latu and Suana Toya made a tackle for loss, then JV on Cole came up with another pick. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to share the uh, audio uh, highlight with you because Richardson mistakenly said that it was DJ Harvey, but the official box score said Cole. So I'll have to let you'll have to take my word for it, but that play was a JV on Cole interception. So San Jose State got gifted yet another short field for 27 yards. But Utah State really made San Jose State earn this because they dropped Conley for a four-yard loss on second down. So on third and 12, Cordero brought out this play from the New Mexico playbook from from the week before. A deep pass to Nick Nash that would seal this game. Time Got an inside release on the right side. Throws it to the right, and it is caught. Touchdown. We wanted to hear from Nick Nash. We heard from Nick Nash from 29 yards out. Touchdown, San Jose State. It was a 35-14 San Jose State lead with 9.08 to go. Utah State would then take nearly three and a half minutes off the clock and an 11-play, 75-yard drive ending in a Hillstead 20-yard touchdown pass to Jalen Royals. With 5.38 remaining, it was desperation time for Utah State as Elliott Nimrod attempted an onside kick, but that kick rolled 18 yards untouched out of bounds. At a 5-yard offsides penalty against Royals, the same player who got that earlier touchdown, and San Jose State yet again got to start a drive past midfield. They also took 3.5 minutes off the clock, albeit with a slower 6-minute drive, a, si- a slower 6-play drive, to deliver this encore touchdown from Kyrie Robinson. The right, two tight ends to the left. Single back is Robinson. Cordero under center. The box is full. Cordero gives it to Robinson. Robinson is in from a yard out. Touchdown, San Jose State. As the Spartans go up 41 to 21 on the. And with that, the final score was San Jose State 42. Utah State 21. The two big factors in this game were defense and ball control. San Jose State had possession for over 37 out of the 60 minutes. They were also plus one on the turnover margin. I would have preferred plus three, but we'll take any win on a turnover margin. Run defense had been a week at this all season long, but no Utah State running back was really able to match their career averages. Leading rusher Davon Booth entered with 64 yards per game underground, but had only 43 at San Jose State. That's just one example. Best of all, Utah State had his reputation as a fast-paced, high-scoring team. I was initially expecting that San Jose State needed a repeat of that 2013 upset of Fresno State that had a 62-52 score. So put it that way, they needed a repeat of the Fails versus Carbowl to beat Utah State. 
and I'm glad to have been wrong. Because sound defense with some takeaways limited Utah State to 21 points, nearly 16 points lower than their average of about 37 points per game. San Jose State returns to action this coming Saturday, October 28th, as they travel across the Pacific to play at Hawaii. Here's what Coach Brennan had to say in his Tuesday press conference about Hawaii. And um, this is uh, this is always an incredibly challenging football game. Like it doesn't matter where the records are. Like you know, um, you know, I, I just I know what going over there is to play. These games are always so. Uh, just highly contested, and um, they are well coached. I think they're better than they've been the last three years. Um, I think Coach Chang's doing a really good job. Um, their quarterback is an outstanding player. They have really good receivers. They have speed. They have guys that can make plays. Um, you know, I think that part of it is something you have to be ready for when you're playing that run and shoot um, because they are. It is so different than what you see all the time. Um, and then defensively. They play super hard. They are physical. They run to the football, like a lot of the stuff that we want our defense to do. And so uh, the game will have a kickoff of uh, 6 p.m. Hawaii time, but that's 9 p.m. Pacific time. So if you're into college football after dark, well, San Jose State has got it. And let's see how they treat how they'll uh, what they'll deliver for the football after dark audience. So Hawaii diplomatic coach speak aside is a team that's in danger of having to sit out bowl season. Why? Hawaii is 2-6, and six, including 0-3 in Mountain West games, and they've lost three in a row. Just look at these scores that Hawaii has had in conference. They lost 44-20 to at UNLV, 41-34 to versus San Diego State, and 42-21 to at New Mexico. That's right. The same New Mexico team where San Jose State went to their house and won by 28 points, Hawaii did the near opposite in that very same stadium, losing by 21. This Hawaii team has given up 40 or more points per game in conference. The only teams they beat were out of conference. They beat Albany, an FCS team, 31-20, and New Mexico State, 20-17. Granted, both of these are quality opponents as both have five and three records right now. And with the way Hawaii was able to contain New Mexico State, I at first had the impression, yeah, Hawaii was going to be competitive in conference and could play good defense. But what's really hilarious is that Hawaii's defense has been exposed as really, really horrible. UNLV dropped 44 points on that Hawaii team. Sounds impressive, right? Well... Last week, Hawaii, I mean, uh, UNLV went home in Las Vegas and they only and they had to squeak out a 25 to 23 comeback win versus Colorado State. Now, to be fair, this is not the same UNLV team that had been a free win for practically every Mountain West team for the past several years. But when you give up 44 points to a team that later goes home and scores only 25, that does not give that does not really uh, give you a good reputation for playing defense. Another example of how porous Hawaii's defense is was their game versus San Diego State back on uh, October 14th. San Diego State scored 41 points at Hawaii. It was a 41-34 to game where San Diego State needed to re- rely on several late uh, turnovers in order to seal this win. But then this past Saturday, San Diego State had a home game and lost by a score of 6 nothing. I'm not making this up. They lost a football game 6 to nothing, And guess who they lost that game to? Nevada. You heard that right. They, San Diego State is supposedly one of the, has to be one of the best teams in the conference. And the arrogance of their fan base online shows that. But San Diego State scored zero points against an 0-6 Nevada that was on the verge of being disqualified from the pro season. Zero points. And I must repeat myself once again about that New Mexico team that, that could score only 24 points at home versus San Jose State. 
And they only reached 20 po- or more points because of a garbage time touchdown that was scored when the game was really out of hand late in the fourth quarter. But then they doubled up Hawaii with 42 points on that same home field. Braden Shager is the returning Hawaii starting quarterback, and he's showing to be quite turnover prone. In Mountain West play, he's thrown eight touchdowns and five interceptions. On Saturday at New Mexico, Shager threw three interceptions and got strip sacked. Looking at the way they performed against a common opponent in New Mexico, Hawaii has got to be the exact opponent where San Jose State can locate weaknesses and attack them, namely sloppy turnovers and porous defense. They did that against New Mexico on the road and Utah State for homecoming, and they have got to do so too at Hawaii. So up next will be my conversation with San Jose State Athletics Director Jeff Konia about how the year in Sparta has gone. But first, here's a quick look at the rest of San Jose State sports. Women's soccer will officially not have the chance to defend their Mountain West Tournament Championship after losing 2-1 versus Air Force Sunday on Senior Day. San Jose State led 1-0 after a Sabrina Weinman penalty kick in the 34th minute. Weinman was one of several seniors honored for their final home game. But San Jose State surrendered two goals in the 59th, and most painfully of all, the 87th. With a 3-9-6 record, including 1-6-3 and three in Mountain West games, San Jose State will have their season finale at Fresno State this Thursday. This has to be a very disappointing way for Tina Estrada to finish her second season after delivering both regular season and conference championships in her first season in 2022 after she took over for her former boss, Lauren Hansen, who got San Jose State three conference championships. A big issue with this year's team was a lack of depth, because many of the 2023 recruits didn't play much, and some key players expected to start on defense had injuries. Some of the injured players on defense were Isabella Shallow Ennis. She would have been a fifth-year senior, and uh, and there was also a grad transfer out of the University of Washington, Washington, who was coming back home to the Bay Area named Tasia Kravitz, but unfortunately, as they showed on Instagram, they had some knee injuries and were not able to suit up at all this season. Women's volleyball is another team that's sadly taken a hard fall from being near the top of the conference standings. Last year, they finished second in the standings in the conference tournament, and they were runners-up in the conference tournament. But now the team is sitting near last in the standings, having started 2-8 and eight in conference play. They lost uh, a couple of games uh, last week, 3-1 versus New Mexico and 3-0 at Air Force. Combine a coaching change from Trent Kirsten to Todd Kress, multiple starters transferring to the school where Kirsten is now at, that's Loyola Marymount, a WCC, WCC school down in L.A., and leading offensive player Blair Fleming out with a hand injury for all of the conference schedule. Blair Fleming did get did play during the non-conference games before her injury. And you could not script a more perfect recipe for disaster. Spartan Volleyball has a road trip this week starting Thursday at Fresno State, then Saturday at Nevada. Both teams had a midweek game on Tuesday in Fresno, where Fresno State beat Nevada 3-1. And finally, men's soccer started homecoming week with a 1-0 win on Sunday, October 15th versus Grand Canyon. But while Spartan football was in San Jose stampeding all over Utah State, metric football was up in Chile, at Chile, Seattle for their last chance at a regular season championship, only to surrender a 1-0 lead and lose 2-1 at Seattle, who could clinch the WAC regular season championship with a win this week. At 3-3-1, San Jose State is fifth in the standings with the regular season this Thursday, regular season finale this Thursday at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. A win would be the easiest path from what the standings look like so far for San Jose State to finish in the top six and qualify for the WAC championship tournament. And so that was your look at Spartan football and the rest of the sports. Coming up next, Athletics Director Jeff Konya. This is Spartan Nation Now. I'm Andrew Pang. Jeff Konya is the Athletics Director at San Jose State. Having been hired in 2021, he is now entering his third season as Athletics Director. He has agreed to join the show as one of the first guests, and I'm very grateful for his choice, 
and his willingness to share his perspective with listeners as the athletics director. I spoke with Konya about the year in Spartan athletics and shared some listener questions as well. First of all, Jeff, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to be here um, to talk about the latest in Spartan athletics for the very first episode. Yeah, Andrew, excited to do that. Appreciate mm-hmm. you having me on and uh, ready to answer your questions. Yeah, so clearly it's been a great week to be a Spartan. So homecoming week, clearly be- it began with a uh, men's soccer getting a win, a big win to um, at, with implications for WAC tournament seating. And of course, it ended with football getting a major, major uh, win over an opponent that's been really tough over the past several years. So how did you feel about homecoming week as a whole? Yeah, I, I mean, just in terms of uh, the buzz on campus, I think it was a great homecoming. I know that mm-hmm. uh, the parades, the fire in the fountain, a lot of the events and activities around homecoming were well attended, and there's a lot of enthusiasm. Um, and then when you overlay some of the athletic uh, components that you mentioned in terms of soccer performances and and football and, and how competitive women's soccer uh, was at home, um, I, you know, it was a it was a well scripted homecoming series of events, and I think the the culmination with the uh, the victory um, on Saturday night at the football game uh, was outstanding. Um, I thought there was great uh, participation by our SJC students body. I thought that was a really well attended game, um, and you know we again our attendance has been really good for about the last two to three years, and uh, and homecoming. Um, you know, proved not to be an exception either. So pleased about everything with that game day, the, the results and, and you know, finally defeating a Utah State team, uh, which I don't think we'd beaten uh, for about a decade and a half. So, um, you know, that was that was obviously fulfilling. Now, clearly it's been a great year for Spartan athletics and I'll get to uh, women's soccer and other sports in, mo- in a moment. But first, uh, clearly the story that's been talked about the most this year was the opening of the new Spartan Athletic Center on the east side of Seth Hughes Stadium. So now that uh, we've gotten to see the, set, the Spartan Athletic Center in action for uh, three home games, um, how has the reaction been that you've seen from fans who have been able to have gotten the chance to sit in the luxury seating? Yeah, I know I appreciate our fans. I know that a lot of uh, individuals were interested to see what the premium opportunities could be in the Spartan Athletic Building. And, uh, you know, I think we've, we have rolled it out fairly successfully. You know, we did not get the schematics, Andrew, until late July, early August. Uh, so about three mm-hmm. weeks and a half before our home opener. And, uh, you know, I got to give credit to our team, our uh, advancement team our uh, multimedia team, um, our external team, uh, as far as getting the preparations, um, certainly our facilities team for all their great work in, in, in pivoting that facility from football operations to premium opportunities on Saturdays. Um, but that was, a, that was a big haul. And, and there were a lot of unknowns heading into the season with that building and how it was all gonna come together. Uh, you know, as far as what was the ticketing, what was the wristbands, assigned seats versus non-assigned seats. There was just a lot of logistical issues that went into planning. Uh, and I'm happy, and I think we've had minimal issues over there since we've opened it as far as the suites and the club. Uh, we certainly would like to maximize some of the other areas there um, in and around the uh, building, especially that that premium area that you see with the uh, umbrellas and the, and the lounge chairs and, and mm-hmm. what that could ultimately become. Right. Um, but we, we're very pleased with the uh, Spartan Athletic Building and, and how it's impacted our student athlete experience and how it's impacted our game day environment. Now, I have seen some of my readers uh, raise uh, raise some questions recently. One was about the grass area in front of the um, building. So uh, earlier, it's been it was reported that um, the grass needed time to mature. What is the latest status about the grass area? Yeah, I, I think the grass area is going to be the grass area um, for the remainder of the season. Um, you know, we, again, need to figure out exactly how to incorporate the grass area into our game day uh, as far as logistics and tickets and those kind of things and what that could ultimately be. Uh, we've been told by our facilities team that it is about a six to eight week um 
uh, rooting process before it could be, um, you know, used aggressively. Um, and honestly, and when did that root and then and when did that six weeks start? Would it have been in July or September? Uh, August. It would August. have been okay. August. So you're September. So at the end of October. I mean, right now we would be uh, looking at what we could ultimately do with the grass, but I, I just don't think that we're gonna we're gonna be in a position to uh, to introduce another uh, area uh, and bring it online this year with two games remaining. Um, I think we're looking at probably doing something a little bit different next year. Uh, as far as some of those premium seating opportunities that are outside the building. Um, and I think our fans can look forward to some really uh, interesting options uh, if they do want to take advantage of that seating and that premium seating on that side. So uh, do you have any specifics as to what uh, is being, what you're uh, proposing for the grass area at this time? No, not, not really. We'll probably take a look at it with the team and see what is uh I know it's been some conversation about maybe making it a family zone or, mm -hmm. um, you know, an SRO area, kind of overflow area. Um, you know, it's not, it, it, how do I say this? It's not an easy hill to sit on. It, it's probably <laughs> the, the easy, uh, if you're over yeah. there and, and, and you try to like sit down or, or lie down on that, it, it is a, it's a pretty steep uh, angle. Um, so, you know, we have to be safe when we, uh, incorporate that grassy berm area. Ultimately, I'd like to convert that grassy berm area into some more loge, uh, seating and some more traditional seating. So, uh, I hope the grass seating is not, you know, something that we're going to have to live with for several years from now. Yeah, I can definitely understand that you've got a vision of converting that uh, east side hill area to proper seating. Uh, I've heard fans who have been outspoken about that issue for ever since the first uh, schematics had come out um, in early 2021. So uh, what would it take in order to move forward with uh, moving uh, to move forward with installing permanent seating on the east side? You look at it probably between 10 and 11 million dollars and that's just a rough guess estimate for uh for seating um you're gonna have to pour new concrete you're gonna have new moorings i mean it's gonna it's a major undertaking to put in that but but the uh the other side of the coin is um you know what we're game atmospheres are are trending in college athletics and certainly in the pro space is more premium opportunities and on our west side, we're very limited with what our premium opportunities are. Um, there's ADA regulations that strictly prohibit our ability to try and even make it uh, make the current footprint even more uh, aesthetically and fan friendly. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we're kind of stuck with what we have there outside of some, you know, uh, I would say like for like improvements. And then, um, you know, with this SAC, SAC building coming on, um, you know, we have some premium opportunities, uh, but I, not quite enough. And that's why I'm really interested in that grassy area where I think we can create some more premium opportunities. And I think that's what a lot of our, uh, you know, sports fans these days want to see is to have access to these premium opportunities uh, to take in a game. And, and that it's not just seating. Like I, I wouldn't just put aluminum bleachers in there, Andrew. I wouldn't just put <laughs> I those. there. I wouldn't put wooden bleachers there. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are big seats uh, with maybe some, um, uh, you know, enhanced experience in terms of uh, access to amenities that's a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, something like that, I think, would really translate well for that space. And if, if we can't get there, then I would just say we keep the grassy berm because I'm not interested in doing something that's subpar in terms of seating. So if somebody brings to me like a three or $4 million project to say, we'll just put aluminum bleachers over there, that's not inspiring to me. We have enough bleachers on the other side. Shifting from facilities to football. Spartan football is on a two-game win streak and still on the hunt for a postseason spot at three and five. But earlier in the season, they struggled owing to a very, very difficult schedule. Back in January when we spoke, you said, and this was after the seven and five potato bowl uh, runner-up season, that a coaching change would not be right for Spartan football. So what are your thoughts now about how the season has gone and what factors would you consider when deciding next steps for the program? Yeah, I, 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 as I was saying, I, I think we're, 
uh, as a society, a little bit reactionary to individual game results, um, which tend to, you know, override what should be done in the long term. Um, in my role, the evaluation process will begin at the conclusion of the season, whether that's after the regular season or after a bowl game. Um, you know, there are some things that, you know, that have, have looked really good in football. Um, and there's some things that obviously um, have not gone our way um, through the early part of that schedule. It was a very difficult schedule, as you mentioned, Andrew. Um, you know, this is a product of schedule making that was several years uh, ago. Um, and, and so like as for, for the fans out there to understand how football scheduling is, is that I just made a call for 2029 yesterday. So like mm -hmm. we're several years out in terms of trying to get our schedules right non-conference. But outside of that, the traditional review process will occur after the, the conclusion of the season, just like we had that conversation in January, Andrew. Mm -hmm. um, but I've already had a couple of conversations with Coach Brennan um, uh, right on the heels of the game at Boise State. Um, and we just kind of discussed, you know, the current state of the program and maybe why uh, the results were shaping up the way they were shaping up. Um, trying to be uh, someone of support and someone who can uh, think a little bit critically uh, with the program. And, and, and Brent's been great at, at, in terms of having these conversations. And obviously the last couple of weeks have, have shown a little bit of a difference in terms of the product of, of Spartan football. So I'm excited for the remaining four games on the regular season schedule. I still think that there's a lot in front of us for football this year. Uh, certainly, I would love to see us uh, 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 either by hook or by crook make our way into the bowl postseason system. Um, right. I think that would be a great uh, a great statement in terms of our intent and, and how we're maturing as a program. And speaking of scheduling, it was announced earlier, uh, early in the season, that uh, there have been now three home games scheduled for the 2024 season. So um, it seems that that move to schedule um, three home games is to give fans more opportunities to see the football program, as, to see Spartan football, as well as to make the schedule a little easier compared to some some of the past years. Yeah, I mean, now with the Spartan Athletic building coming online and just, I think the, the, the cool vibe that we had about our game day, um, you know, giving our fans as many home games as possible is certainly something that we want to offer to our uh, Spartan faithful. Um, but as you know, Andrew, between 70 and 80 percent of home game home teams win in football. So if you can stack a few more home games in a couple of years, right, it gives you a better chance in terms of some competitive success versus playing away from home competition or games. So um, I, I think there is a little bit of a strategy on both sides in terms of, yes, bringing it for the fans, but also trying to put our football team in the best respective position uh, to have a competitive um, competitive year and, and, and to win some some home games. You know, we, we traditionally have done very well since I've been here at home. Uh, just last year, we, I believe we won 6-0. and um, and, and this year, we were fairly competitive at home as well, um, outside of maybe that Oregon State game. Um, and, and half of Air Force, but uh, we, we, we generally have been putting some decent performances together at home. And I, I think that the statistics would indicate that when you can get more home games, uh, things will go well for you. Now, here's a question I'd like to share with from a listener. So there are other two uh, tier two products, projects uh, still pending for South Campus, such as the baseball practice field and softball stadium. So what are the, the listeners asking what the next steps are for such products like those? So for those projects in specific in South Campus? Yeah, South we Campus, have, baseball few, practice field, softball uh, stadium. Yeah, so softball stadium, I'll start there. That is good. That has been a, a project that's been identified as part of our new capital campaign mm -hmm. uh, that should be rolling out from the broader university. Um, so that project will be, uh, um, you know, one of the ones that we're featuring in terms of our, uh, our Spartan faithful to, to, uh, hopefully support financially and, and get behind, uh, through that capital campaign, uh, our baseball field, we have, um, obviously we put the baseball field, the practice field, I should say, uh, in place. And it's been operational for about a year now, Andrew, and 
Uh, we've had some stop and starts with the construction. Um, there's been some issues and some hiccups here that we've had to clean up. Um, I think the big project there is to get bullpens um, activated uh, for that site uh, to put our baseball team in a better relative position in terms of practice opportunities and, and as, as important as pitching and bullpen pitching is. Um, I think that would be the right next step for that particular field. And the final project in South Campus that I know that we're working on behind the scenes is uh, to complete the golf facility with a phase two. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always been talk about wanting, putting a more permanent uh, building structure in the, into that site um, and what the amenities could be uh, with, with a building like that in terms of offering to the community and our <clears throat> teams in terms of locker rooms and um, you know, uh, uh, hospitality and, and those other kind of things that we think we can uh, put into that building over there in the, in the golf practice facility. Um, and then we have a, a final project we're looking at in terms of uh, bringing a mobile video board um, to the to the site uh, and how that would work would be it would be attached to a, a vehicle uh, and then it could rotate in terms of providing video and some some game atmosphere for the soccer uh, complex, but also for softball and, and some of the other South Campus uh, events. So those are kind of the things we're looking for and, and thinking about for South Campus. A lot of this is predicated on the student athlete experience, but also for our fans to take in games. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what we're thinking about what the next projects are for South Campus. Yeah, and so in a couple of weeks, basketball season is going to be starting up and some questions about the, the teams. Uh, Tim Miles is going to be back for his third season with men's basketball, and it's going to be his first season now that uh, Mountain West Player of the Year, Omari Moore, has moved on to the NBA. And on the women's side, April Phillips, head coach is on, is that head coach, uh, she's in her second season. And like Tim Miles, uh, April Phillips had to fix a difficult situation on her team. So what are your thoughts and expectations about uh, Spartan basketball this coming season? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in both those programs for different reasons. I, I, I think Tim, obviously losing Amari Moore, uh, getting some of the folks back from last year's team, adding some talent. Um, from the recruiting world uh, into the team. It's gonna take a time for the, all of those, uh, uh, the returners and, the, and the, uh, the folks that are in the program to gel together. Um, you know, I think they've sustained a couple of injuries through practice that hasn't helped in terms of that cohesion. Um, but I think once we hit Mountain West play, we'll, we should be firing uh, on all cylinders. Uh, the Mountain West obviously is gonna be a very, in terms of uh, the men's basketball, is going to be a very competitive um, uh, conference. Um, hopefully, it can rival uh, all the good things that happened from a basketball standpoint last year to the conference with several postseason opportunities and, and all the high profile runs and those kind of things. Um, but yeah, so I think that there's going to be kind of more of a patient approach with the men's basketball team and with the roster composition. Um, as far as the women's basketball in April, um, you know, this is the second season. It's been a complete roster overhaul uh, from what she has inherited. Um, so again, we got a lot of young, uh, younger individuals with uh, uh, hoping to get game experience and those kind of things. And I think that both teams from this perspective are going to use the non-conference to try and, and get that cohesion and, and learn a little bit more uh, as they head into to Mountain West play at the end of December. But um, there's a lot of talent on both teams. I think the fans are really uh, gonna like some of the, the different uh, talent on, on both the rosters. Um, I think they play a fun brand of basketball from what I've been able to take in and practice. And uh, yeah, I'm excited for both the programs to get going here in a couple of weeks. Back to um, facilities again, this time about basketball. I got this question from, question from a listener. What is the progress um, on the basketball court upgrade? Uh, the basketball court is down. Um, so we got a new court with, uh, with the markings and everything. Um, we, and I think, you know, the fans are going to really like, <laughs> you know, having this new court down. Uh, we have that uh, blessed and uh, to, to be uh, integrated with, our brand new video board and, and some of the other things we're looking to do from a game atmosphere. We're, we're thinking about 
moving some different components around the game day environment where students sit, where the band sits, those kind of things. Um, so we're, we are tweaking the game day atmosphere, trying to get it to where uh, it, it can be a real competitive advantage for both teams. Uh, but that's going to be predicated, obviously, on, on individuals coming out and cheering and, and, right. and really taking ownership. And is the design still going to be that uh, that circuit board design that was posted online last year? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, so fans are are going to expect that as uh, seen earlier. And so, going back to men's soccer, as I alluded to earlier, they had a big win to begin homecoming week, and it was reported by the San Francisco Chronicle um, that Simon Tobin, head coach, he's on a track for a fourth straight winning season, and has been reported that he plans to retire next season. Would you be able to confirm if that is correct? Um, well, his contract runs through the end of 2024. I know we've had initial conversations that he might want to mm -hmm. uh, ride off to the sunset. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that that's not the case. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll have those conversations after this season and heading into next season as to where Coach Tobin is. And uh, we certainly would like and um, I'm going to encourage him to think about staying with the program a little bit longer. And my last question will be about a couple of uh, teams that had done really well last year, but have uh, taken a bit of a, a fall, uh, a downfall this year, women's soccer and women's volleyball. Last year, women's soccer won both uh, um, the regular season and conference tournament under uh, Tina Estrada. She signed a contract extension, but, un but uh, unfortunately, women's soccer is going to miss the, uh, miss the uh, uh, postseason this year and then women's volleyball was number two in the standings and and runners up into conference tournament but they had a coaching change and some roster changes as well and now they're uh struggling in conference but clearly you made two different decisions just whether to hire from within or to um do a formal or to do a full uh or to hire from the outside for these programs so do these show that hiring a head coach is hardly an exact science <laughs> Yeah, it, there's no uh, script that you can just follow and point to to to, to make sure um, the hiring goes as, as what you want. Now, obviously, you know, you, if you just look at the results, then you have a different pr perspective probably than, than if you look at the realities in each of these programs. First of all, women's soccer, arguably four or five of the most influential players for this year's team are, were lost for two season-ending injuries. I mean, they've had to convert midfielders into defensive backs just to get through the latter half of the um, conference schedule here. So, um, you know, we, we've been super competitive in all of the women's soccer games. We've just come up short by a goal or, you know, late goals going in against us, some weird stuff happening. Um, and it's just that's soccer sometimes. Uh, but we really have been playing with one hand behind our back from uh, just in terms of roster talent, being able to go down the pitch, which – Suggest that next year, when everybody's healthy and back, hopefully we'll we'll be able to um, you know get back to where this program traditionally is and near the top of the conference. And then with volleyball, uh, obviously we lost our coach. And the way the transfer portal now works is um, very you know liberal for uh, when a coaching coach leaves. That uh, individuals on that roster have a lot of choices where they otherwise would not have had choices outside of the transfer portal. So you're going to have situations where coaches leave and you have completely different rosters from year to year. And that's exactly what happened with, with volleyball. Uh, and then, you know, one of our more um, influential players, Blair, Blair Fleming goes down and isn't able to compete. And, you know, we basically are starting a brand new volleyball um, roster in terms of who's starting these games as compared to last year's team. So, um, I think Todd is great. He's been able to build programs and, and, and compete at high levels before. He's brought in a lot of young talent. We have like eight or nine uh, first incoming players on this team, and they're already holding their own. And, you know, we just don't know how to win yet in volleyball with such a young roster. And that's where we're playing games super competitively. All the games are in the 20s, and we're just not winning a lot of those uh, at this point. They got to learn how to win with a young team. So you still stand by your hire of a uh, Todd Cress and what you said back when we spoke in January about him being the right fit for um, what you saw at the time for volleyball. Yeah, one thousand percent, thousand percent. Well, well, Jeff, thank you very much for uh, 
taking the time to join me for episode number one of Spartan Nation Now. And I'm sure that our fans will uh, really enjoy listening to our conversation and getting the latest news about Spartan athletics straight from the source. Thank you, Andrew. Always a pleasure to talk with you. I really appreciate what you do for our program and, and hats off. Thank you. This is Spartan Nation Now. I'm Andrew Pang. My next guest is someone you're familiar with, and you've read his articles before on Inside S. Spartans, Lorenzo J. Reyna. He's a reporter for 24-7 Sports and other sites with a focus on high school and college football in California and the West Coast. We recapped the last week in Mountain West Conference football and made some picks and predictions for the next week in Mountain West football as well. So let's start with the best team in the league. That's Air Force. They're now 7-0 and and 19th in the nation after an out-of-conference uh, service academy rivalry, in it, rivalry win by a score of 19-7 to at Navy. So San Jose State, I saw, um, I did get to see Air Force in person when they came to San Jose State and just went mm-hmm. off with that 35 nothing run in the second half. But right. um, when I saw Navy give up, that 94 yard touchdown pass it's pretty rare to see that kind of play among triple option teams i just mm-hmm. i admit i had to feel relieved <laughs> yeah i i was um i mean i guess every now and then like air force hits you with like something unorthodox but it's weird because like you normally think that they're gonna run the football anyway <laughs> it's just that like when it comes to the triple option i'm sure you know andrew it's one of those things where you need a good set of eyes. And if you have a bad set of eyes, you're not going to find where the football is and it's just going to get ugly from there. So, I mean, Air Force has had a very significant run, but I have to be honest with you, Andrew, I feel like, and I know that we throw out this term a lot when it comes to college football. I feel like they're in for a trap game this upcoming Saturday when they, when they go against Colorado state. The Ram Falcon rivalry game. So uh Certainly, Colorado State, they had a horrible season last year when they were just transitioning from the in, during the coaching change from Bobo to Norvell. But I could tell this year right. that Colorado State has improved. They even beat Boise State this year. Yeah, I mean, that was like the uh, – that's something that you don't get on your bingo card very often, especially when Boise made the transition over to the Mount West. But it literally took a Hail Mary full of grace, literally, for uh, for Colorado State to win. But – you know, honestly, Andrew, I feel like that in a sense, I'm not surprised by the progress that Colorado State has gone on. And I think because like you obviously know very well from from following San Jose State, mm-hmm. Nevada under Jay Norvell, they had some very competitive teams. Yeah. And so like Jay's brought that over clearly to Fort Collins. I mean, obviously it doesn't show with the the win and loss record right now, but you know, he's brought in some of his uh, former Nevada guys, a la Torrey Horton, but <laughs> he's also uh, reeled in some pretty de- uh, decent recruiting classes. But, you know, it seems like that there's been slowly but surely a momentum shift in Fort Collins from the Steve Adagio era, which, I mean, I could tell that Adagio was trying to be like this physical downhill running team, whereas Norvell, he wants to be more explosive, spread it out, get his receivers involved. So, all the more reason why there's a part of me that that's kind of teetering towards Colorado State possibly pulling the upset. Now, obviously, I could be wrong, but you know, I I wouldn't I wouldn't sleep on this matchup, honestly. Yeah, right. Yeah. So Steve Adazio, I didn't realize that he was the coach in between Bobo and uh, Bobo and Norvell. So let me correct. So I I will stand corrected on that. But but granted um let me i'm looking up mike bobo's coaching record right now he was yeah. a pretty bad well, coach bobo was boo-boo. Bobo was, yeah he was boo-boo at uh fort collins and then uh adagio didn't help much either it was crazy too adagio actually had some pretty decent recruiting classes but they just they just could never never get on the w side but one of their one of the adagio's w's in colorado state was on at home versus the san jose state i mean that was one of those. Yeah, I do that, remember that. <laughs> one of those L's that cost San Jose State a second straight bowl. Yeah, I I, I do recall that one. That wasn't <laughs> easy to write for inside the That wasn't. Well, I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't able to travel to Colorado at the time, so uh, maybe Jackson might have written something about that game, but but I'll uh, 
I'll have to check, but going back to, uh, so earlier, going back to the this uh, week's upcoming rivalry game, so you said that this is going to be a trap game. Do you envision Colorado State being able to stop the triple option, or will it be another 35 uh route? What do you anticipate? I'll, I'll put it to you this way, Andrew. I feel like that if this game somehow becomes a high-scoring match, I feel like the advantage can go to Colorado State. Mm-hmm. And I say that because Norville is just – and again, going back to his days in Reno, he's just so used to those high-scoring games. And you could go back even further. Norbert was at Oklahoma. I mean, as you know, in the Big 12, it's like, you know, defense is an afterthought literally over there. So <laughs> they were so used to the high-scoring high scoring fest. Now, I would imagine that Colorado State, they already know that Air Force wants to establish the run. It's just that they're going to establish it through – some exotic formations with their their triple option scheme, but I would think over time you would uh, be able to to get acquainted and get adjusted to that. So, I mean, I feel like that. I think that the magic number, Andrew, for Colorado State's defense, if they're able to hold Air Force to maybe underneath the 175 yard mark for rushing yards, mm-hmm. I think they could be at a good advantage. Which it's hard to do when you're going against a triple option like Air Force, but, right. you know, if they could limit the explosive plays and also ensure that there's no, they're, they're going to work for the end zone or even keep them out of the end zone and get them to field goals, they'll be on an advantage. Now, this is an Air Force team that's been consistently very high scoring in conference play, putting aside the recent 17-6 to win at Navy. They scored 45 at San Jose State. They even dropped 49 on, on the supposedly good defensive San Diego State team. And uh, Colorado State, on the other hand, is a team that's uh, struggled a bit on def- on defense. So, would that be yeah. a would that be a weakness for Colorado State? I mean, sorry, Air Force to attack. I mean, Col- Air Force is already uh, they've had the benefit of going against some not so stellar defenses, and so obviously, with Colorado State struggling, as you mentioned, on defense, I mean, it does still bode well for Air Force. And another thing to keep in mind, I mean, unfortunately as impressive as that victory was for Colorado State against Boise State, we have to remember they did give up a lot of points in that game. And so it, it came down to a Hail Mary. So, I mean, I I just foresee it more, Andrew, that I feel like this Air Force-Colorado State game is going to be a lot closer than people think. I don't, I'm don't. i starting to get the sense that this is not going to be that blowout that people out who follow Mountain West football is, is looking at it as. Yeah, time will tell whether uh, your prediction comes true or their prediction comes true. And we'll get to back to Colorado State in a little moment. But I'll shift over to a beat that you're very, you and Jackson are very familiar with in Fresno State. So last weekend uh, was a bye week for Fresno State, but they'll be back in action this Saturday versus UNLV. Now, uh, I don't know how long you've been following Mountain West football, but I remember the days when UNLV was basically a free win for pretty much every Mountain West team. But look <laughs> what they're doing now. Yep. They're six and one. Yeah. It seems, and it seems that firing Marcus Arroyo, the former San Jose State quarterback and Brett Brennan's good buddy, has really paid off for them when, uh, with the coaching change to uh, the former Missouri coach. I, I, shoot, I forgot Barry Odom. his name. Barry Odom. Yeah, Barry, Barry Odom. Odom. Barry Odom. Yeah, that's right, Barry Odom. And so UNLV's quarterback, Jaden Mayava, he's only a freshman, but the way he's been playing, the way he's been putting points on the board for UNLV and that comeback drive in the last minute, it's, it's as if UNLV signed Patrick Mahomes to their squad. <laughs> yeah, you know what? So um, you mentioned Marcus Arroyo. So I feel like, honestly, Andrew, Arroyo, to me, still there's a, deserves a lot of credit for what he did at UNLV. And the reason why I say that is because he legit left behind a bowl caliber roster for Barry Odom. Now, honestly, it's like, and I mean, I'm like you, I follow UNLV for a number of years and you normally would think like, this is going to be like a cakewalk game for either a Fresno state, a San Jose state, San Diego state. Well, it started to get more and more competitive when UNLV was on the schedule. And a lot of it was because of not only a Royals coaching and how aggressive he was, but some of the recruiting classes that he was bringing in. Well, you know, when they fired Arroyo, I mean, it was it was really a perplexing move considering the momentum that was being installed at UNLV. So I look at it like Odom inherited, literally inherited a bowl caliber team. Now, obviously, like 
they've done things like pretty much like two times better than we envisioned. But also we'll add this. So I think what also helps UNLV, Andrew, is who their offensive coordinator is. And that's Brendan Marion. Everywhere Brendan has gone, his offenses have just like, they've improved so drastically. And I mean, even at Texas, when he was passing game coordinator, like the receivers that he had, one of them being Xavier Warby, who's from the Fresno area, mm-hmm. those they they saw some some unforeseen production under Brennan. And now you're looking at UNLV now on offense. It's one of the more explosive offenses in the conference, let alone the nation. So, but again, I just look at it like, well, Royal still to me deserves a lot of credit because it's like he he put if I could best shorten this out, Andrew. I feel like that he put UNLV in a better position than where it used to be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, now speaking of UNLV and being a free win, um, I, th- I think San Jose State learned it the hard way back in 2019 when the week before the Fresno State game, San Jose State went to Las Vegas but lost by um, four points in a game, in an ugly oh, turnover-filled right. game. That was basically the loss that finally cost them bowl eligibility. And in 2021, it took a last minute sack by, I mean, a last second sack by Kyle Harmon to seal a very close win too. So you're definitely right that UNLV is no longer the free win that they used to be. And um, although I will, I will say this, Andrew. So it it was actually kind of the reverse of it where UNLV and Fresno State, it became a, it literally became a free win for UNLV when Tim DeRuiter was coaching. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that was uh, the year that um, they had Charles Williams, who um, was from Fresno. And I remember, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure Randy Cross was the uh, color commentator in doing the Fresno State at UNLV game, which I believe was DeRuiter's final year. And the joke was, I guess DeRuiter doesn't know where Bullard High School is. <laughs> and so, like, Bullard <laughs> like, was like 10 minutes away from Fresno State. So, I mean, it was... Um, yeah, it was a disaster during that time, but it was the, one of the few times where, like, if you're UNLV, you saw Fresno stay on the schedule, and you immediately say, oh, easy W. Yeah, those 2013 to 2016 years went, were pretty had to be pretty brutal on both sides of the Valley rivalry because you got two new coaches hired in 2013 who hired very who inherited very good rosters, and look what yeah. happened in the end of their runs. Yeah, but you know, I think San Jose. I think your the San Jose State was in much better shape compared to what DeRuiter left. I mean, it was like, it was almost as if like he kept pouring kerosene and kerosene every year, and that fire just just wouldn't stop going. But on the other hand, it took Brennan four years to just to get San Jose State a winning season. Yeah. But uh, uh, but uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Tedford was able to turn 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 around Fresno State in just one. Yeah, so with with Tedford, I mean, this, mind you, this was also before the transfer portal really blew up. He was able to uh, work to get Marcus McMarion, who was a prominent local prospect, prominent local standout from Dinuba. He was able to get him via the grad via grad transfer over from Oregon State, and so him being in that structure, being in a Power Five structure where it was a lot more efficient, a lot more night and day. I think that also parlayed into the season that Fresno State had. And I think another thing too, Andrew, the when DeRuiter and that staff left, it was almost like it was a breath of fresh air <laughs> for a majority of those players because it's just the vibe we got at Barkboard was that it just became very, very negative. Like you saw literally players who couldn't wait for practice to end and they just bolted to the parking lot. You didn't really see that under Pat Hill. And you're not seeing it now with with Jeff Tefford. I mean, it's like the enthusiasm has definitely made its return. I mean, it made its return the moment Jeff Tefford got the job. But it's like, I mean, yeah, those DeRuiter years, it's like, I mean, I'll put it to you this way, Andrew. Like, you can't go to Fresno mentioning Tim DeRuiter. I mean, you'll get nope. run out of town. So <laughs> I promise, I promise. Next time I go to Fresno, I'll make sure to I'll make sure to, to keep that in mind. And uh, and yeah. there, was, there were definitely similar. There was definitely similar negativity among the fans and even among some players back when Ron Carricker was coaching. And clearly, it took Brent Brennan a while to clean that mess up. And there's clearly all the disadvantages structurally that San Jose State Athletics has had. But that's a discussion to be had another time. And if I may go back to the San Jose State of more a bit. Now I know the rivalry game is about three weeks from now, but uh, 
having seen San Jose State and Fresno State have to play, but San Jose State and Fresno State having played a common opponent, Utah State, within the last two weeks, let's compare how their defenses played relatively. So when Fresno State played at Utah State, they won by just five points, and they gave up over 200 rushing yards, while San Jose State and San Jose won by 21 points and held Utah State to just about 100 or so rushing yards. Now, granted, Fresno State had to face um, Utah State's senior quarterback, uh, Cooper like ah, but, um, but Blake Anderson somehow decided it was a great idea to try true freshman McKay Hillstead at San Jose State. So do you think those games against Utah State may be a bit too small a sample size to predict the Valley rivalry game in November? Yeah, I mean, you you hit it on the mark, Andrew. Like, I was perplexed about that quarterback change. Like, but then again, we're we're not in Logan, so we don't know like what's going on half the time over there. But I mean, that quarterback from the Fresno State game, like when you go back and watch all four quarters of that game, he was a big reason why Utah State stayed in that game. He was giving Kevin Coyle's defense so many fits. But then it's like you when you put in a new quarterback, it's almost like either way you look at it your whole dynamics is going to change. I mean, you're not going to get the same flair for like creating plays in chaos or the same downfield attack. So it was almost as if in that game against San Jose State, it was almost as if in secrecy, Blake Anderson scrapped everything and started brand new. And that's why I felt like that game was a lot more one-sided than it was. Granted, like, I mean, San Jose State, even with Kyle Harmon and Cade and all those guys gone and Viami as well, I mean, it's still it's still relatively a pretty pretty experienced defense, and so like they're not going to be fooled by a team that's that's rolling out a new quarterback at the last minute. So it was like it was a shock to see just how badly Utah State digressed in that game in comparison to the Fresno State game. But again, I look at it like, well, the big difference is what you did at quarterback. I mean, it's like whether. You're, people want to admit it or not it's like you put in a new quarterback it's it's going to change completely i mean even from from the side of fresno state you've seen logan five mm -hmm. you've seen logan five uh, go in for for mikey Keene. now granted the the situation was an injury well five is more of a runner i actually think in a sense five is actually a better more mobile runner than mikey Keene. maybe not a better passer but by putting in five, it's like, well, Tefford has to incorporate some stuff to where he's able to take advantage of five's legs. He's able to take advantage of his mobility. And so I don't know like what, what Blake Anderson was was figuring or what went into the decision to go with the freshman against San Jose State, but got to be realistic, Andrew. Like that that decision to put in the quarterback, I mean, it, it led to the very one-sided victory for San Jose State. And one of the more astonishing uh... – astonishing play calls that Utah State had was on that fourth and one from the 33 down seven points in the third quarter and they went for it and they didn't try a sneak or yeah. a, a handoff or anything they went with a pitch uh, with a with a pitch that was like five yards behind the line and then they got stuck for a loss it's like they thought that they could try anything again they were watching film of all the times that San Jose State got burned on fourth down and gambled on a really low percentage play with a freshman quarterback and then that's when the game fell apart for them. <laughs> I, I hope in Blake's case, like, I hope he doesn't think that he secretly had Caleb Williams on his <laughs> side. I mean, only Caleb Williams will pull off those kind of plays. So. And did you watch show the, the Eagles versus uh, Dolphins on Sunday night? Because the yeah, Eagles did, actually yeah. went, for, went for it on fourth down twice in the fourth quarter, up seven points inside their own 50, and they were able to yeah. run enough time off the clock. I think he must have been up 14 after – no, no, no. That was after the interception at the one-yard line and then that. Yeah. And those plays helped set up that uh, late touchdown to ice the game. Yeah. And then, of course, there's that brotherly shove. I don't call it the touch push. I call it the brotherly shove. I just think it's more catchier. <laughs> yeah, who knows if we'll see that play in uh, a future Utah State game, but uh, – in any case, let's take a look at next week's uh, opponent for San Jose State. They'll be at Hawaii this coming Saturday. Um, so Hawaii is 2-6 and six and in danger of being disqualified from the postseason after losing 42-21 to 21 at New Mexico. Now, this is a New Mexico uh, team that had uh, entered that game having lost 14 conference games in a row. 
and San Jose State right. had played there the week before, excuse me, with a 52 to 24 win in that same stadium. I felt impressed when I saw Hawaii beat New Mexico State 20 to 17 up in up on the islands. Now, New Mexico State's uh, similar to UNLV in that they're no longer the uh, free win that they used to be. But since then, I'm looking at Hawaii's uh, scores in Mountain West play, and they've been, and they honestly have had a porous, porous defense has been giving away 40 or more points per game. So, given that, um, so what have you seen out of this Hawaii team so far under Timmy Chang, and what do you sense out of their uh, fan sentiment? Yeah, you know, with I feel like so in going back to when they hired Chang, I mean. They knew right away, and I would hope that in the case of Hawaii, they had the realization that Chang was inheriting a mess because Todd Graham was the uh, the previous regime, and Todd Graham literally became this like dictator, off a of, off a of Torian. I mean, any tradition you you could think of at Hawaii, it was like Graham didn't want it anymore. And so, like, Chang, Chang had to be in a situation where it was going to be a slow build. He would have to really, like, first and foremost, try to gain positivity from the remaining players, but then, like, do his part in installing the offense, the defense, the culture in general. And unfortunately for Hawaii, it's, it's, it's gotten a lot slower than expected. And now we're in this era of college football where people are going to demand results right away. So, I mean... In a sense, it's like, well, I mean, I would give Chang maybe at least two more years in this current model. And unfortunately, it's it's not Chang's fault that his alma mater was literally left in shambles by Todd Graham. But, you know, with Hawaii, it's like, I mean, you they're the way they're set up, Andrew, I feel like it's more a situation where they have to play offense, try to score as many points as they can and pray for that one final defensive stop. Unfortunately, they're not built for defense right now. They would have to literally hit, like, <laughs> not so much the transfer portal, but they need to hit the Juco. They need to hit the Juco realm for, like, any available defenders that are out there. But, yeah, it's like, you know, Chang being, uh, I would think with Chang being Hawaii royalty, like, they would be a lot more patient with him, but we'll see. I mean, Again, it's like, I don't think it was his fault that he inherited a mess. I mean, that mess was was courtesy of Todd top, top Bowles. And then another thing to keep in mind, Nick Rolovich. Nick Rolovich had a good thing going at Hawaii before he ended up Washington State. And now it's like, you almost wonder if he's regretting that move to go to Pullman because he didn't last long in Pullman. Yeah, and, is, well, and what conference is Washington State going to be in next year? <laughs> Big sky. <laughs> Maybe they, they finally uh, get the big sky to merge with the, the Mount West and form like the super sky. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, and speaking of, and you said earlier about uh, Timmy Chang being Hawaii royalty. Well, ask Scott Frost how well being royalty worked for him, right? You know, and a good point, because, I mean, I was thinking, you know, the, the dummy in me also thought Scott Frost was a gift hire for Nebraska, and that didn't work out, and you know, there's another one too who um you know Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh had a, a little bit of a rough go at Michigan. Now he he seems more subtle, but now they're back in the, the spotlight for the wrong reasons. Oh. Um Jeff Tedford, Jeff Tef Yeah, Jeff Tedford, he's he's practically was Fresno State Royalty, played there, graduated there, and obviously he has Fresno State going again. Um yeah, it's like I mean, it's kind of hit or miss when it comes to the um when it comes to like the um the alums or like the the legends who come back to their school. Yeah, it's always hit or miss. But again, with Chang, it's like, I mean, I just felt like it wasn't his fault that that Todd Graham just left that university where it was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it I hope that so we um fans should understand um whether they're at San Jose State, whether at they're at Hawaii, that oftentimes a coach needs time to clean up a mess that was left behind by the previous coaches. So and whenever I've spoken with San Jose State's athletics director, I did speak get to speak with him earlier today. He is mm -hmm. has been taking a very analytical approach to any any difficulty that San Jose State has had, and it remains to be seen if Hawaii, uh, Hawaii's leadership has the same approach when it comes to Chang. 
Yeah, I've started to notice that a lot more. And then I think another issue too with um with Hawaii, um, Andrew, and I've seen I think you've noticed this also more and more on the recruiting trail. Mm -hmm. The secret doubt on Hawaii talent. I mean, you got power five universities going after guys from the island, guys from the rock, guys from from Honolulu. I mean, the, just the surrounding communities of Hawaii. And I'm sitting here envisioning that. I've had this conversation with people from Hawaii. Imagine Hawaii, if they were able to keep all of their, their in-state talent. You're looking at Seriously. a top 25 program. Yeah, you're looking at a top 25 program every year. But unfortunately, you go back to um, 2007 when they had that the run to the Sugar Bowl. That was when like the secret got out on Hawaii because like yeah you had like guys from California a la God rest his soul Colt Brennan he was a California guy Devon Bess was a Bay Area guy but the team was predominantly in state talent well unfortunately the secret got out now it's <laughs> like all these Power Five schools are going after Hawaii yeah fair enough and so uh, so back, going back to Mountain West football for a moment we got uh, I'll close it out with the laugher of the week so Nevada so Nevada was zero and six heading into Saturday night. And they were they're also on the verge of bowl ineligibility um, against a very supposedly a great defensive team in San Diego State. So, you know how you know how bad Nevada was during their 0 6 run. They even lost to Idaho. Idaho. Mm -hmm. You can't lose to Idaho in this day and age, right? You know, uh, Andrew, like when they lost to Idaho, I was half tempted to just put a toe tag on Nevada and just throw them in the morgue. But apparently they're alive and kicking. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so Nevada was two and ten last year was one of those really painful seasons where you start two and zero and then end zero and ten, and then they enter this year zero and zero and six to start the year, which is a total of sixteen losses in a row. And so last Saturday they go to San Diego to take on San Diego State, a team that on paper is supposed to win. But guess what the final score was? Nevada six. six zero. San Diego State zero. So, uh, what did you uh, think of that I'm, game? <laughs> I'm I'm starting to think, Andrew, that in secrecy, San Diego State could be the worst team in the Mountain West in disguise. I mean, it's like you. I mean, I can understand losing to a UCLA, mm -hmm. but losing to Nevada, who was winless, and then losing in that kind of fashion. I mean, now it's gotten so bad, Andrew, that there's people who are already starting to think that this could be Brady Hoke's final year. As a coach, period. Yeah, you, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. This game, it, it, yeah, this game kind of had echoes of back in twenty fourteen, the the senior yeah. day game where San Jose State had a whole bunch of uh, good things going. They were able to get into red zone multiple times, and they hosted yeah. a really cruddy Norm Chow coach Hawaii, but then committed all sorts did all sorts of stupid stuff like turnovers and blocked uh, chip shot field goals, and then lost the game thirteen nothing. I get the feeling that this game against Nevada could be the game that be, where the team just quits, right? Yeah, you know, another thing too, like Hoke, from what I remember, Hoke is near his mid-60s. Mm -hmm. So it might be one of those issues where Father Time finally caught up to him. And unfortunately, like, even with the resume and how he was able to rebuild himself at going back to San Diego State, unfortunately, it's it's starting to almost look as if, like, people have caught up to San Diego State. They know them as a downhill team. They know them as a defensive mindset team. And now it's like this loss to Nevada, it's almost like, you know, it could be this, it could be the 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 ammunition they need to finally decide that they need to go in a different direction. Maybe get somebody younger or somebody on the rise. But yeah, it's like, I mean, how if you're San Diego State, like how low do you, can you get losing to a winless football program and let alone a Nevada team that you know they were they were also they also became a mess once Jay Norville left and the fact that they didn't have enough money to pay him that's one of the reasons why he left for for Colorado State as well now I'm looking at San Diego State's schedule right now and their wins in retrospect don't feel very impressive they all of their wins have been by one score they even beat a so-so Idaho State team by just eight points and they needed a bunch yeah. of late turnovers just to beat Hawaii by seven. All right, so a little bit of note on Idaho State, Andrew. Yeah. The Idaho State team is also going through a coaching change themselves. Because Charlie what? Ragel, 
Yeah, Charlie Ragel was uh, the head coach last year. And then when when Kenny Dillingham got the job at Arizona State, Ragel was actually one of his first hires. Mm -hmm. So Idaho State's going through a coaching change. And the fact that they hung with San Diego State, it speaks volumes. Yeah, they yeah, yeah, Idaho State does have a first year head coach right now, uh Cody Hawkins, that's Dan Hawkins' kid. And so far yeah. it seems that he's doing a pretty impressive job impressive job over there. They even beat um Eastern Washington a couple weeks a week or so ago. And Eastern Washington as you saw almost beat Fresno State. <laughs> yeah, so um so never underestimate any opponent. That's a lesson, right? That's been Especially if they represent the big sky. I mean, it's like a lot of those big sky schools, Andrew and I, I can add this uh, from my experience covering Cal Poly. A lot of big sky schools, they, they're they literally Mountain West teams in the flesh. And there's been years where I honestly felt like the big there were schools in the big sky that had more talent than the Mountain West in its entirety. Like there's been some years, and you might have seen it too, there's been some years where the Mountain West felt down. Well, those were the years where the Big Sky Conference was like on a high. I mean, Montana State was a power. I mean, they still are, but Eastern Washington, this was like the era of Cooper Cup, Kendrick Bourne, like that receiving crew. Um, you know, UC Davis had Keelan Doss at the time. I mean, it's like, I can go on and on, but that was like a very, very competitive time for Big Sky. And it still is a very, very competitive conference, even after Troy Taylor left. Yeah, and we'll see how many bids the Big Sky is going to get in this year's FCS um, playoffs. And so going back to San Diego State's schedule, they've got a bye this weekend, but then they've got Utah State at home on November 4th, then Colorado State in Fort Collins on November 11th before heading to San Jose on November 18th. Now, selfishly, I would like to see Utah State beat the snot out of San Diego State so that I could feel better about the way San, San Jose State won by 21. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, you you can pray to the football gods there. See what happens there. <laughs> well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pray to the football gods that the game I'm gonna be going to is a very competitive one between UNLV and Fresno State. Yeah. So the, we'll see how uh, this week will unfold in Mountain West football. So this uh, this week is going this week's matchups are going to be Wyoming at Boise State, Air Force at Colorado State, New Mexico at Nevada, UNLV at Fresno, and then finally. At for football after dark, San Jose State at Hawaii. So, Lorenzo, thank you very much for agreeing to join me tonight to uh, talk about the first week of Mountain West football. I hope that Jackson can join us next week. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure uh, Jackson, when he gets over his bug, uh, he'll be good to go. Like, he, unfortunately, he, he kind of got on IR, which is very, very rare. He's usually, like, one of the more healthier people around. <laughs> but I'm sure he'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, we get get well soon, Jackson, and uh, thank you once again for your time today, Lorenzo. Yeah, thanks again, Andrew. You're very welcome. Have a good night. Thank you. This is Spartan Nation now. Once again, I'm Andrew Pang, and now your comments. On the inside of Spartan's premium board, I post this question exclusively to premium subscribers. And this is an appropriate question, I feel, due to the slow start to the season. If you were the athletics director, what results would you want to see to welcome back the offensive and defensive coordinators in the 2024 season? One answer from Spartan Mike. I would want to see the team win out or at the very least make a bowl game. It looks as if changes have been made on the offensive side of the ball after a couple weeks of getting away from the run in the second half when it was working in the first half. The defense looks rejuvenated now that the offense is doing its job. The defense has confidence again after their first half struggles against New Mexico. Leonidas had a more detailed response, which I'll try to make more concise. Leonidas says, I want to see the Spartan offense be capable of, one, passing the football for yardage, especially so in between the 20-yard lines, with short and intermediate type passes and involving the tight ends. To a greater extent in the middle of the field, and two, running the football with needed success all throughout the length of the playing field, which is important to make successive first downs and to control control the game clock importantly. With regards to this SJSU defense, three, 
I prefer to see an aggressive defense at all times and attacking style defense. A three-man pass rush is not very appealing to me. I remember the days of the Claude Gilbert and Donnie Ray of the Chicago Bears, 46 style defense during the 1980s all too well. A passive defense is to be avoided as much as possible. 4. What we've seen of the Spartans on both sides of the football in the last two games versus New Mexico and Utah State has been enjoyable football, hearkening back to some of the glory days from 1973 to 1992. Keep all of the above up and running, and I'd personally be satisfied with the work of Kevin McGiven, offensive coordinator Kevin McGiven, and, defense, and defensive coordinator Derek Odom going forward into next season. So these were very two thoughtful comments with reasonable expectations and conditions for retaining two of Brennan's top assistants next seasons. The offensive and defensive coordinators faced a lot of justified questions after the disastrous three-game losing streak that included a 20-point lead given up at Boise State. Time will tell if San Jose State can continue to stay in pursuit of a second straight bowl game, something that hasn't happened since 1987. And finally, Van Halen. Late in the homecoming game versus Utah State, there was an injury timeout, so the PA system at Sefcu Stadium played an interesting choice of music. Van Halen's 1991 hit song, Right Now. When I heard the lyrics like, come on, turn this thing around, and one by one, little problems build up. I instantly thought about how the Spartans football team that showed up for homecoming and last week for at New Mexico was not the same one that quit in the second halves of three previous games. So in a more, in a more lighthearted moment of Saturday's press conference, I did ask Brennan if he agreed that the song symbolizes his team's journey. Kalen, I won't try to be Sammy Hagar, but some of the lyrics are like indicative of how the season has gone, such as turn this thing around and why put it off another day. So uh, would you agree with that? I would. I would. That's a great song. You know, I'm a child of the 80s, so the Van Halen was definitely a, and definitely a big deal. But, um, and that's a great song. And, and that's like a, a, a really big, uh, I would say, battle cry for us here is like, like, let's just worry about right now. Let's not worry about the outcome. Let's not worry about next week. Let's not worry about, like, and that's a hard thing for young people to do, right? Because you get so caught up in this sport on the outcome, right? But when you're looking that far ahead, you miss what's happening right now, and what happens in right now impacts the outcome, right? And so um, it is a really appropriate song, and I did not pick up on that, but I love that song. Do you think it's as good a sing-along as Lean On Me? Um, Lean On Me has a little bit different meaning for our team, um, but I thought they did that today. I thought they definitely leaned on each other today. You know, I think um, that's, like, like I said when I started this, this this uh, interview or whatever, it was press conference. Like these players are doing this for each other. Like they're not they're not focused on what the record is. They're not focused on what the negativity or what people are saying or what like all that stuff out there. They're just worried about the guys in this room and and what they're doing day in and day out. And that's giving us a chance to play better football. And that's a wrap on Episode 1 of Spartan Nation Now, heading into Spartan football's game this Saturday at Hawaii. Kickoff will be at 6 p.m. Hawaii time or 9 p.m. Pacific. Unfortunately, it's not going to be on any of the regular cable channels or the Mountain West Network because of Hawaii's exclusive pay-per-view TV rights. So you'll have to check this SJSUSpartans.com official athletics website for viewing info. Somebody on the 24-7 board may have um, a, a link to a video stream, but... Or you could just listen to the game on KTRB 860 AM in the Bay Area or its website if you don't want the trouble of having to download a third-party app like you would probably have to do to watch the official telecast of the game. Thanks for listening this week. And with basketball season starting soon, be sure to catch a more basketball-centered episode next week and hopefully a recap of a Spartan football win. Take care, everyone. Mm-hmm.